This is the last video of the three-part series on proper threat analysis. And today we're going to talk about regional threats. Sometime in the future, I will do a video on the mega disasters, such as pandemics, super volcanoes, economic collapse, nuclear war, that sort of thing. But that's not what we're going to discuss today. For those of you that live in coastal areas, the threat of a hurricane is very real. Now, personally, I have never been in a hurricane. Um, I do appreciate, though, that usually you do get a warning when it's coming your way. Um, sometimes here in the Midwest, when a tornado happens, we don't get any warning at all. Last week, we actually had four tornadoes in Michigan. As you can see by this map, hurricane-affected areas include all Atlantic and Gulf of Mexico coastal areas, Puerto Rico, the U.S. Virgin Islands, Hawaii, parts of the Southwest, the Pacific Coast, and the U.S. territories in the Pacific. Here in Michigan, we sometimes experience the after effects of a hurricane with heavy rain and storms. Hurricanes are rated into five categories. As you can see, a Category 4 hurricane has winds 130 to 156 miles per hour, and a hurricane rated category five has winds in excess of 156 miles per hour. Two recent memorable hurricanes are Katrina and Andrew. Katrina was only a category three when it reached landfall. However, it left in its wake an estimated 1,833 deaths and the National Flood Insurance Program paid out 13 billion in claims. Now, Hurricane Andrew was upgraded to a Category 5 10 years after it occurred. In Hurricane Andrew, there was 65 deaths and 41.1 billion in property damages. FEMA has a How to Prepare for a Hurricane Guide, and I think you'll find this guide very helpful. I'll leave the link up above. When I experienced that earthquake in California, I really had no idea what to do. Um, I thought that you had to stand in a doorway, you know, the frame of a door. But now they say that that isn't what you do. Instead, you want to drop, cover yourself as much as possible, and hold on to a big piece of furniture or something. So you don't stand in the doorway. Anyway, here is a guide that will give you a lot of good tips if you live in an earthquake-prone area. I am by no means an expert on hurricanes, so please bear with me. I'm going to read from a list down here of things that you need to keep in mind to prepare for a hurricane. Number one, purchase flood insurance so you're covered, gives you peace of mind and financial security. Have supports cut to size already that you can easily put up and board your windows. Trim all dead branches from trees or dead trees so you don't have to worry about them. Have a lights out kit that contains lots and lots of flashlights, solar charger for your cell phone, a solar or hand cranked um, NOAA radio so you can get the alerts. Of course, always have adequate water and food on supply and have alternative cooking methods and alternative heating methods. Have a family communication plan, very important in case you get separated and pre-plan evacuation routes. Always have more than one. And have an idea where you might stay when you evacuate. Plan how to evacuate your pets. Also important to have all your important documents with you. And my choice is to have a grab and go binder. And I have a card on video on that. Have your family pictures stored in the cloud and on USB drives so you can grab them and take them with you. Have your go bag, your 72 hour bag, ready that so you can just grab it and get it into the car. Always keep your vehicle tanks at least half full. And if uh, there are weather warnings, make sure your tank is as full as possible and you may want to fill other gasoline containers. I always see um, in the news when something like this happens that there's long lines to get gas. And this is one way to avoid that and get right on your evacuation route and get out of Dodge. Have a supply of cash 
and always keep an emergency kit in your car. I have a card on that. When authorities issue a mandatory evacuation notice, do it as soon as possible. Don't hesitate. Even though it might turn out to be nothing, it's better to be safe than sorry. If you expect to go to a shelter after evacuating, download the American Red Cross Shelter Finder app. And I'll leave the link right here. This app displays a map of all open Red Cross shelters and provides the capacity and the current population of each shelter. You can also text SHELTER, S-H-E-L-T-E-R, the plus sign, and your zip code to 43362 to find the nearest shelter in your area. We recently had a 4.2 magnitude earthquake in Michigan, and believe me, that is quite rare. Um, it actually occurred only 46 miles from my house. Um, I was driving in a car at the time and I didn't feel anything. But my husband and youngest son was at home and they heard this loud roaring noise and the house actually shook. Now, when I was in California uh, some time ago, I did uh, experience an earthquake, although at first I didn't know what I was experiencing. I was sound asleep uh, in my bed on the 22nd floor of a hotel and I woke up very disoriented and I felt like I had the bed spins even though I hadn't drank any alcohol and the whole building was creaking and when I got up I walked like a drunken sailor. Anyway, my mind finally processed that it was an earthquake and I got down to the main floor by using the stairwell of course. Um, there was some damage in the hotel, mirrors broken, uh, chandeliers dropped, that type of thing. But basically, we were all okay. Here is a map that indicates what areas of the country have a higher earthquake risk. Where I live, there is little risk. However, if you live in Alaska, Hawaii, or along the Pacific coast, the risk is much greater. Unfortunately, for those of you that live in California, scientists recently revised their forecast estimating the risk of a magnitude 8 or larger earthquake in the next 30 years has increased to 7%, up from 4.7% in the previous assessment in 2008. FEMA also has a guide on how to prepare for an earthquake, and I've placed a link right here. Please bear with me again. I am not an expert on earthquakes either, so I'm going to have a list down here and I'm going to read it to you. They say it's a good idea to take action now before an earthquake hits, and that is true with preparing for any emergency. You want to secure any items or furniture that might fall. Um, the Urban Prepper had an excellent series on just that, and I'll put a card here to it for your reference. You want to develop a family communication plan again. You want to have your important documents ready to go, so again, I recommend the grab-and-go binder. I also recommend a robust first aid kit for any injuries that might occur. Again, pre-plan evacuation routes in places that you'd be staying. Have family pictures stored on the cloud or take them on a USB drive. Have your go bag ready to grab and go. Have your vehicle as full of gas as possible and extra containers filled with gas. Have a supply of cash and always keep an emergency kit in your car. The first movie I remember as a young child is seeing Bambi in the theater with my brother. And that forest scene haunted me for a long, long time. Wildfires can occur anywhere and can destroy homes, businesses, infrastructure, natural resources, agriculture, etc. They can start from natural causes such as lightning, um, but unfortunately most are caused by humans. Uh, maybe from cigarette smoking, campfires, um, outdoor burning, or even intentionally. Flying embers from a fire can set fire to buildings more than a mile away from the fire itself. Smoke can also cause health issues for people, even for those far away from a fire. Always practice fire prevention. As Smokey the Bear always reminds us, only you can prevent forest fires. For more information, download the 
How to Prepare for a Wildfire Guide, which provides the basics of wildfires, explains how to protect yourself and your property, and details the steps to take now so that you can act quickly when you, your home, or your business is in danger. Again, you want to have a communication plan. You want to have an evacuation plan and places to stay when you evacuate prearranged. Um, you want your get home bag ready. You want your pictures on uh, USB drives or in the cloud. You want to have some extra cash. You want to have your vehicle filled with gas and maybe some additional containers of gas. Be as ready as you can. And again, a robust first aid kit is a good idea. I live in Michigan and there truly is water, water everywhere. I live only 40 minutes from Lake Michigan and we experience plenty of rainfall and have really never had a problem in my area with drought that I know of. You might not know this, but the Great Lakes are the largest surface freshwater system on the earth. Only the polar ice caps contain more fresh water. These lakes account for 84% of North America's surface fresh water, which is about 21% of the world's supply of surface fresh water. Thus, it's hard for me to imagine a drought. The worst droughts in the history of the United States occurred during the 1930s and 1950s, and that period was called the Dust Bowl years. And those droughts led to significant economic damages. Here is a current U.S. drought map. It is quickly evident that California is experiencing the heaviest area of drought. The ongoing drought in California is likely to have a major impact on the state's agricultural production. Because California is a major producer in the fruit, vegetable, tree nut, and dairy sectors, the drought has potential implications for the U.S. supplies and the prices of affected products this year and beyond. Nearly half of the fruit and almost a quarter of the vegetables we eat come from abroad, mainly from Mexico, Canada, China, and Chile. But water supplies are dwindling worldwide. Thus, food prices could escalate. Droughts can also cause wildfires. And for those of you who live in California, I gotta ask, why you have to worry about earthquakes, wildfires, um, drought, possible tsunamis, you name it, you live in a pretty risk-prone area. In this case, think of like the avian flu, which has wiped out many, many factory bird farms in the Midwest, um, or mad cow disease and what that did to uh, the Europe. And there are also crop failures. The Great Famine, or Potato Famine, in Ireland between 1845 and 1852 resulted in mass starvation. Over 1 million people died and 20% of the survivors emigrated elsewhere. The culprit was potato blight. What if a similar disease would wipe out all of our corn crops or our soy or our wheat? What would we do? Well, one of the things I do is try to preserve and put by as much food as I can. So I can a lot and I dehydrate. And I really recommend that you do the same. It is also a great hedge against inflated food prices if something happens. I am sure all of you have lost power at some time. And if you're like us, it usually happens because of weather events or someone hits a transformer in a car accident. I think we all remember Hurricane Sandy, where people were without power for 13 days or longer. However, the power grid has failed in the past due to mechanical failure. On August 14, 2003, a widespread power outage struck parts of the northeastern United States and Canada, affecting an estimated 55 million people. The outage was caused by a computer malfunction in Ohio that led to an unprecedented and widespread power grid failure that contribute to at least 11 fatalities. Those affected only lost power for up to two days. The National Geographic's American Blackout movie explored what would happen if such an event lasted for longer than two days. Results were definitely not encouraging. Like most emergencies, 
have plenty of water and food on hand, alternative methods to cook the food, um, alternative methods for heat, and have solar charger for your cell phone, and have a good NOAA radio, and have some method to protect yourself. And of course, plenty and plenty of flashlights. The USA is the world's foremost producer of nuclear power, and it accounts for 19% of our total electric needs. Two industrial accidents come to mind when I think of what could happen with nuclear power. Chernobyl being the first event had a fire and explosion that released large quantities of radioactive contamination into the atmosphere and spread over much of Western USSR in Europe. Of course, the second largest nuclear event is Fukushima, which occurred in 2011 and seems to still be ongoing. If you live near a nuclear power plant, you definitely should prepare for such an emergency, especially individuals who live in areas where natural disasters such as hurricanes, earthquakes, and tornadoes could damage nuclear facilities. The map below shows all of the nuclear power plants in the U.S. If you live within a 10 mile radius of a nuclear power plant, you should have a pre-planned evacuation route. Find your local power plant online and read the emergency plan. Self-defense sirens and the emergency alert broadcasting system will be activated if an accident occurs. Turn on your radio immediately to get the instructions if you are to stay in place or evacuate. If you are instructed to stay, close all windows and doors, turn off fans and air conditioning, and bring children's and pets inside. If you have a basement, go there. If you are instructed to evacuate, do so immediately. If you are traveling in a vehicle, close all windows and vents to prevent radioactive material from entering the car. In Michigan, K1, uh, which is potassium iodide pills, are given free of charge to anyone who lives within 10 miles of a nuclear power plant or if they work within that radius. Um, all you have to do is fill out a voucher, go to a pharmacy, and they'll give you them free. In some states, you will only get them if an incident has occurred and they're given out at the nuclear evacuation facility. You can purchase these pills online, but please remember, they are only to prevent future thyroid problems. They do not protect you from radiation, and for many people, it is not a good idea to take K1 tablets because they have a thyroid autoimmune disease or some other ailment. Volcanic eruptions can be accompanied by other natural hazards, such as earthquakes, tsunamis, mud flows, acid rain, rock falls, and landslides. Active volcanoes in the United States are mainly found in the Pacific Northwest, Alaska, and Hawaii. We usually don't associate volcanic eruptions with mainland U.S. However, Mount St. Helens eruption in 1980 was the deadliest and most economically destructive volcanic event in the history of the United States. 57 people were killed, 250 homes, 47 bridges, and 15 miles of railways and 185 miles of highway were destroyed. A massive debris avalanche triggered by an earthquake measuring 5.1 on the Richter scale, caused an eruption that reduced the elevation of the mountain summit from 9,677 feet to 8,363 feet and replaced it with a one mile wide horseshoe shaped crater. This map shows historic volcanic activity and its hazards over the past 10,000 years in the US. Red triangles represent volcanoes Light orange areas have lower volcanic hazard, while dark orange means higher volcanic hazard. Light gray areas have lower ash fall hazard, and dark gray areas have a higher ash fall hazard. Always evacuate immediately from the volcano area to avoid flying debris, gases, lateral blasts, lava flow. Also be aware of mud flows. Um, danger increases from a mud flow near running water, and for prolonged heavy rains. And believe me, mud flows can move much faster than you can walk or run.
Protect yourself from ash by wearing long sleeve shirts, long pants, and protect your eyes with protective eyewear such as goggles, and definitely wear eyeglasses instead of contact lens. Use a dust mask or hold a damp cloth over your face to help with breathing. If you do have to drive in heavy ash, and please don't do it unless absolutely necessary, keep your speed down to 35 miles per hour or slower. In 2003, my boys and I traveled to Thailand and we ventured to Phuket and took an excursion to the PP Islands. We snorkeled in crystal blue waters. It was just beautiful and we relaxed on the beach. Only a year later, the area was devastated by the tsunami that killed more than 200,000 people in 11 countries around the Indian Ocean. Tsunamis are triggered by earthquakes, volcanic eruption, and landslides. And if such an event occurs, a tsunami can happen and be triggered within minutes. Tsunamis can happen in the U.S. In 1964, an Alaskan tsunami led to 110 deaths, some as far away as Crescent City, California. As you can see by this map, five Pacific states, Hawaii, Alaska, Washington, Oregon, in California and the United States Caribbean islands are especially vulnerable to tsunamis. Check out this link for tsunami safety recommendations. The most important thing to know is your current elevation and the elevations of possible evacuation sites. I think this sign says it all. Run, run as fast as you can to a higher elevation if you suspect a tsunami. I have uploaded the Excel threat analysis tool if you'd like to use it for your prepping needs. I hope you have found this video series helpful. And sometime in the future, I will cover the mega disasters. Um, if you're thinking about movies, think like Contagion, The Day After, or Super Volcano. Anyway, this is Prepper Potpourri. Please give me a thumbs up if you like this video, and please subscribe and share the knowledge. As always, thank you so much for watching.